Read the purport for this text by Sula Prabhupada. The Bhagavatam affirms that any person who is fully in Krishna consciousness or devotional service of the Lord has all the good qualities of the great sages, whereas a person who is not so transcendentally situated has no good quality because he is sure to be taking refuge in his own mental concoction. Consequently, it is rightly said herein that one has to give up all kinds of sense desire manufactured by mental concoction. Artificially, such sense desires cannot be stopped. But if one is engaged in Krishna consciousness, then automatically sense desires subside without extraneous efforts. 
Therefore, one has to engage himself in Krishna consciousness without hesitation. For this devotional service will instantly help one onto the platform of transcendental consciousness. The highly developed soul always remains satisfied in himself by realizing himself as the eternal servitor of the Supreme Lord. Such a transcendentally situated person has no sense desires resulting from petty materialism. Rather, he remains always happy in his natural position of eternally serving the Supreme Lord. Om Mahyana Timarandasya Yananjana Shalakaya Chatsurun Nilikandena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishram Apitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamayam Dadati Swadhandikam Vandeham Shri Gara Shri Radhakamalam Shri Gurum Vaishnavam Shya Shri Rupam Sagrajadam Sahagana Radhamatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Chakvaitam Savadutam Vaidarai Sadam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakamitam Shya Hey Krishna Padana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Chakrapade Gopesha Gopika Tanda Radha Kanta Namastuke Tapta Kanta Nakorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Krishna Shabana Sude Devi Pranami Hari Vancha Kaupatarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Padikanam Pahanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shiva Sadi Kora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So Lord Krishna is replying to a question asked by Arjuna just previously. The verse before, Arjuna had asked, Stita Pragna Shakabhasha Samadhi Stasya Keshava Stita Kim Prabhaseta Kim Masita Prajeta Kim Arjuna was asking to Lord Krishna What is the nature of one who has achieved transcendence? How does he speak and what is his language? How does he sit and how does he walk? So Lord Krishna immediately responded to this question and this is the answer to the very first question which Arjuna asked. There were several questions you could see but Arjuna wanted to, to know what, are the, what is the nature of one who is achieved transcendence. So here the answer is given. The nature of a person who has achieved transcendence is Stita Pragna. Stita Pragna. Stita meaning fixed. And Pragna, knowledge, is fixed in transcendental consciousness. By dint of self realization. So he is Stita Pragna. And this great here, he, he has given up all varieties of desire for sense gratification. Now generally in the material world everyone is busy in the matter of 
sense gratification. We have senses and we want to satisfy our senses. So everyone is busy in that matter of sense gratification. Of course, there are different levels of sense gratification. We could say the liberated souls also have some sense gratification. Actually, you cannot give up sense gratification. Just like uh, Prabhupada would give the example, if you cook food with no salt, then it has no taste, right? So the, the salt has to be the correct amount. If you put too much salt, it won't be good. And if there's no salt, it's also not good. That has to be the right amount. Of course, some people, they want a lot of salt. That's going to be harmful for them not good for health, you take too much salt, you get not good for the heart. And if there's no salt, there's no taste, then that is unnatural also. It is not satisfying. People who are very renounced sometimes, they will give up all salt, no salt. They don't want any taste, so they say no salt. It is a type of renunciation. So to deny the pleasures of the senses. Some people will try to stop all sense gratification. They will say, uh, some people go away from the world to avoid sense gratification. Some people take vows like Mona Vrat, a vow not to speak. Because they're, they know that when once they will speak, they will speak all foolish things. So they make a vow no speaking. Some people, I remember when I used to make uh, I, I was working in life membership in Calcutta in the 1970s and there was one of our life members who was telling me how every Sunday he does Mona Prat. Of course, Monday to Saturday he's talking a lot of things. But Sunday is Mona Prat. So, you know, it's not really renowned, it's, that is bogatiaga, like bogatiaga, flickering, alternating sense enjoyment and then renunciation. That is not actually real renunciation. But some people, they feel satisfied like that, one day doing monavra. And some other people, they will try to deny the senses. They will say, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, right? Sometimes we see these figures outside the Buddhist temple. In Buddhism, they will promote that kind of mood. Just like if you go to a, a Buddhist monastery for a, a retreat, Maybe you go for the weekend, so many monasteries like the, in Thailand, there's a place in Thailand that attracts a lot of people, a place, there's a town called Suratani, you know Suratani, yeah, you've been there? So uh, they have Buddhist temple there and it has a retreat and many people come from all over the world to come to the retreat and of course the the, the Buddhist mood is don't speak to anybody, right? You go to the monastery, you're coming for the retreat, don't speak to anyone. You, don't, you didn't go there to make friends. 
You went there to get away from the world, to get out of the material world. So they say, don't speak, don't look, don't hear, like that. That is denying the actions of the saints. So here, we're talking, Lord Krishna is describing someone in transcendental consciousness. He gives up all varieties of desire for sense gratification. Of course, there's a variety in sense gratification. There's the pleasure of the tongue, there's the pleasure of the ears, there's the pleasure of the eyes, the pleasures of the nose, and the pleasure of the skin, the five senses. And they each give their own variety of pleasure. And even within that, there will be varieties, just like the varieties of sounds, the pleasure of the ear. Some people like to hear classical music. Some people like to hear popular music. Some people like to hear bhajan and kirtan. There's, there's many varieties of sense pleasure. So, the Chitta Pragna is described that he gives up all varieties of sense gratification. This is talking about material sense gratification. Of course, some people may take it in another way. Some people may think you have to give up all activities. Because every activity we perform, there'll be some kind of pleasure in it. As I said, there has to be some salt in the food. Otherwise, there's no taste. And if you have no activity, how long will you be satisfied? And just like the Buddhist or even the Mayavadi, they will give up the activities of the senses. They will practice renunciation. Stop everything. They like to go into the mountains or into the forest away from everyone and everything. And they just, they what, what will they do? They'll do nothing. They will simply sit and do nothing. And actually that happened in the history, in the past, when Buddhism had spread over India, that people, you know, they gave up the Vedic culture, Lord Buddha came and taught Ahimsa and he taught everybody is equal, he taught everyone is the same and everyone should just sit and do meditation. Don't, don't follow the Buddhists, they taught the world is not real, nothing is real, just sit and do nothing. And they sit and contemplate nothing. Just like you go to some Buddhist temple, one temple in Thailand, they, they keep a dead body there. They keep a corpse there. And everyone comes and they will sit and they will meditate on the dead corpse. And they think, this is our future. The, I'll become a dead corpse, we'll become dead, nothing. And you just simply sit and meditate on the dead body, that this is the ultimate end. Or sometimes, you'll see in Buddhist temples, in the Buddhist compound, they always have a, a crematorium, where they will burn the bodies of the dead people. So, uh, some monks, they like to go and sit inside the furnace. You know, of course, wait till the furnace cools down, but, you know, but they like to go and they just like to sit there 
and that feeling that this is ultimately, this is where life, this is the end of life. That with death, everything is finished. And indeed, Professor Kotovsky, the Russian professor, when Prabhupada went mm -hmm. there to Moscow in 1971, the head of the Asian Studies Department, one Professor Kotovsky, he said to Srila Prabhupada, at the time of death, everything is finished. So that was his thinking. Uh, Prabhupada was shocked that this man, he didn't even know the basic knowledge about the soul, that the soul is eternal. So in Buddhism, like that, they have Buddhism, they, their philosophy is sometimes called anatma, that there's no soul. Or if they do, if you do find there are some Buddhist masters who speak about the soul, but they speak about the soul that ultimately it becomes nothing. Ultimately it will be destroyed, it will be just uh, annihilated, finished. So, although they speak about the soul, they don't understand the nature of spiritual energy. That spiritual energy is eternal. And they speak about it as it can be destroyed. So in Krishna consciousness, we talk about giving up the desire for sense gratification, but at the same time, there is a higher sense gratification. There are different levels of sense gratification. We do not encourage people to try to give up all activities, but rather we encourage people to purify their activities, to bring the actions up to a higher level. Just like there's the level of the animals, and there are the levels of the human being. There's different levels of eating and sleeping and mating and defending. So these activities go on in different ways. You can eat like the pig. The pig can eat stool. It can eat all kinds of garbage. So human beings, some human beings, they also eat like the pig, without discrimination. They'll eat anything and any, everything. So we don't say, stop eating. But we say, as a Krishna conscious person, somebody who is a sthita pragna, who is actually fixed in real knowledge, he will discriminate about what to eat. He will consider what is the proper food to eat. And he will want to eat that food which is offered in sacrifice. Yagna shishta. The food which is offered in sacrifice we generally call as prasad, the mercy of the Lord. By eating prasad, then we, we are taking food which is free of all karma, karma reactions. So that is the highest level of eating. We may give up eating, but how long can you give up eating? Not for very long. Sukadeva uh, Maharaj Parikshit rather, it was fasting for seven days. He had seven days to leave the world. He did not eat, he did not drink. Somehow he maintained his life because he was in transcendental consciousness. But it is very rare. We know if you just do one day without water and food, it's quite, quite extreme, it's quite difficult. You have to be quite healthy to be able to do that. And to go on for more than one day, then it becomes, you become, you come closer to death. Actually, it's, a, it's a, like a death experience. When you don't eat, you don't drink, 
you're getting near to death. So, Jai Shri Shri Radha Krishna Kanaya, Nirvai Gauranga Rai Shri Pai. So, in Krishna consciousness, we still eat, but we are eating is on a transcendental level because we eat food which is pure, which has no karma. And similarly, when it comes to sleeping, a devotee in Krishna consciousness will also sleep. But Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, the yogi is one who will not sleep too much or sleep too little. How much sleep you need will vary depending on the individual. Some people need more sleep, some people need less. Depends a lot maybe on the type of work you do. If somebody's doing a lot of very physical work or very mental energy, men mentally demanding work, then he can be very tired at the end of the day and he may need more rest. But some people they can get by with very, very less rest. But generally, people need to take some rest, they need to sleep. And then other activities are also there, just like mating, defending. So these things can also be purified. They can be performed in pure consciousness. Some yoga systems, they will practice total celibacy total abstinence from all contact with the opposite sex. But in Krishna consciousness, that is not required. Rather, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Dharma Varude Bhuteshu Kamosmi Bharata Shabha. Lord Krishna says that I am that sex which is not against religious principle. So Lord Krishna himself is saying that he becomes that activity because that's a very important activity to create souls, to bring souls into this world and to give them the chance to take birth. It's a very important service. And when it's done properly, then Lord Krishna says he himself becomes that activity. And then defending. Defending, we want to defend what actually belongs to, to Lord Krishna and what is used for the service of Lord Krishna. What is actually ours, is nothing is actually ours. For one who is in God consciousness, he does not think himself to be the proprietor, but he understands everything is the property of the Lord and he is using everything for the service of the Lord. So he will take care, just like the human body. We have our bodies, we have to take care of our bodies. We have to protect ourselves. Just like when there's a disease, when there's a pandemic, people take precautions to protect themselves. We can see people wearing masks over their face to protect themselves and also to protect others. So that is defense. That is, of course, that is also good. We have to take care because the body is given to us for the service of Lord Krishna. It's not that we have to defend things simply for our own pleasure, but whatever we can use in the service of the Lord, then that is important. So the, the Sita Pragna, the person who is fixed in real knowledge, he gives up all varieties of desire for sense gratification, which are material. And Lord Krishna explains, which arise from mental concoction. In other words, the desire for sense gratification is actually coming from our mind. We should understand the mind is not our real self. 
the mind is a material element. Just like the body is not a real self, the mind is also not a real self. We have a gross physical body, we have also a subtle body. The mind is part of the subtle body. So desires come from the mind. And we should understand these desires which come from the mind are not actually our real self. It's not that we actually need these things, but the mind is telling us, you should do this. The mind is saying, you need to eat more. The mind is saying, you need to sleep. The mind is saying, you need to mate. The mind is dictating to us these different demands, different desires which we have. So we should understand what is coming from the mind and what is actually the desire of the soul. There's a difference. The demands of the mind will be based more on the material, on the body. But the demand of the soul will be in relation to our spiritual needs. Our soul needs also certain things. Our soul needs Krishna consciousness. Our, our soul needs to hear the holy name. We need to chant the holy name. We need these things. They are the medicine for the soul. So then Lord Krishna said, and when is mind thus purified? In other words, the mind can be very contaminated. The mind is influenced by the material energy. We have material desires. We're thinking, I want, I need. What we actually need is much less than what we think we need. So the mind dictates to us. But when our mind becomes purified, then we find satisfaction in the self. In other words, the mind, when it's purified, the satisfaction is in the soul, not in the mind, not in the body, but in the soul. The real satisfaction comes on the spiritual platform, not on the physical platform. On the physical platform, it is not satisfaction, it is just greed and lust, and we're never satisfied. On the physical platform, our mind will not be satisfied. We have to bring the mind up to the spiritual platform by devotional service. So when we come to that platform, find satisfaction in the self, then he is said to be in pure transcendental consciousness. Try to understand there are different levels of consciousness. There is bodily consciousness, there is mental consciousness, and then there is the spiritual consciousness. Spiritual consciousness is transcendental. It is on the higher platform. The body and the mind, that consciousness is material. So in conditioned life, we, we have that kind of consciousness. We're thinking about the body, what my body wants, what my mind wants. We're influenced by these thoughts. But on the transcendental platform, we become aware of ourselves as a spiritual being, as a soul. And we think about the soul. We think about ourselves as a soul and how our soul also needs something. Our soul also has needs, but not needs like the material body. Our soul needs transcendental service for the Supreme Lord Krishna. 
That is the need of the soul. So one who comes to that kind of consciousness, then he is in pure transcendental consciousness. So consciousness. Some people are not even conscious. Although they're living in the body, they don't even have conscious, they're not even conscious of who they are or what they are. They, they don't think about it just like when people become intoxicated. They're not aware of what they're doing. They're not aware of what they're saying. They have, they have some consciousness, but it's very covered, very polluted. So that is the lowest consciousness. We see, again, the animals. The animals, they can, their consciousness is always centered around food and sleep. They're thinking like that. The animals, the dogs, the cows, and so on, the birds, they're always thinking, where is food, and where will I sleep, and where will I mate, like this. So that is their consciousness. They don't have any higher consciousness. They cannot ask, who am I? They cannot ask, why am I suffering? They never ask these kind of things because their bodily, their body situation does not allow it. But when you come to the human form of life, then you have a greater opportunity. We have better facilities. So many nice facilities are there in the human form of life. But with facility comes also responsibility. The responsibility in the human form of life is to inquire and to make investigations, to understand about the nature and the goal of life. If we don't inquire, if we don't make this kind of investigation, then we have wasted the valuable opportunity of the human life. And we don't know how long it will take before you get the opportunity again. Now we have come to the human body, and we don't know how long it may take before we get again this opportunity of the human body. Even though you may have the human body, you may not have the opportunity to associate with spiritually minded people or in a culture, in an environment where there's an opportunity for self-realization. There are many parts of the world where there are human beings, but there is no opportunity to inquire into the absolute truth. There is no opportunity for people to be guided in their spiritual journey. So we are very fortunate that at this time in our journey, we have come to the human form of life. And we can begin to inquire, to ask, who am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? Sometimes we will ask, why am I suffering? Everyone wants to be happy, but not everyone is happy. We are forced to accept suffering. So we should understand, why is there suffering? What, what, what is the cause of this suffering? So those who are in transcendental consciousness, they've understood these things. And they've come to that platform. They've come to the higher consciousness, the greater awareness about the real self. They've understood that the goal of life is not just simply eating and sleeping. That there's many, there's other things to be done. It's not just simply solve the economic problem and all the problems are solved. It is foolish to think that just by solving the economic problems, we will get 
success in life. There are many wealthy people who are the most miserable, the most unhappy. We have to understand the nature of human life. As human beings, we are all spiritual particles and we have come to this human form of life. The body is a gift and it's an opportunity for us not to just be like polished animals. Srila Prabhupada talks about polished animals. In other words, the activities are the same, only you're a little more polished, a little more refined, but the same business, eating and sleeping, all these activities are going on. The dog eats its grass and we eat, some people they're eating, they go to the restaurant or they take from the canteen or they eat somewhere, they get some snack somewhere. Somehow they're eating without too much concern about what they eat and about who made it and about uh, what is the condition, what is the quality of the food, what is the condition. So polished, polished cats and dogs. We have a nice air-conditioned room to sleep in and the animal is sleeping in the streets or in the garden somewhere or in the yard and you have your nice air-conditioned room to sleep in. But it's the same business. Prabhupada said, we are moving on four wheels and the dog is on four legs. But the same activity, where is food, where is sleep? We have to understand human life is meant for more than these activities. So those people who are stita pragna, they have come to the transcendental consciousness. They also engage in activities. They're also eating, but eating sanctified foodstuff. They're also sleeping, but only they just sleep what is required to keep themselves healthy. Try to understand it's not that we have to give up all activities, but what we need to do is to regulate everything in a manner which will allow us to cultivate transcendental consciousness. Transcendental consciousness begins with the chanting of the holy names. When we chant the Maha Mantra, then from the sound of the Maha Mantra, our consciousness can be elevated, can be brought up from the body, from the mind, it can be brought up to the transcendental platform. So this opportunity is available for everyone. It is a simple science. And everyone who will practice this process, they can achieve the desired result. So Lord Krishna is replying to Arjuna in this way. Arjuna wanted to understand how one is in transcendental consciousness. Because Lord Krishna has been speaking about transcendence and about having transcendental consciousness. So Arjuna was a little puzzled. He wanted to understand it more. What does it mean, transcendental consciousness? So Lord Krishna is explaining here. What is the meaning of this transcendental consciousness? It doesn't mean stopping all activities, but it means purifying activities. Right? We don't stop the activity. We don't stop eating. We don't stop sleeping. 
but they should be purified. That is the difference. We have to learn how to purify our activities. This is yoga. Yoga means union with the Supreme. So we connect our activities to Krishna. Our eating is performed in relation to Krishna. Our sleeping is done for Krishna. Our mating is done for Krishna. Our defending is done for Krishna. Everything is dedicated in the service of Krishna. That is transcendental consciousness. All right, are there any questions? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, um, is this Tita Pragnya the same as the Brahma Bhuta Prasadatma level? Well, Brahma Bhuta means knowing that you're Brahman, you take pleasure in the self, right? So, one who is Brahma Bhuta may not be devotee, they may simply they may have just simply stopped all activities. So there are different, some difference there. Sita Pragna, one who is fixed in transcendental consciousness. That is, and we're talking about Krishna consciousness. We understand this in terms of Krishna consciousness. Sita Pragna. That if, if we try to stop activity, how long can you stop the activities for? How long can you fast? How long can you go without sleep? You cannot do these things for very long. So some people may stop these, you know, some of these Brahma Buddha. But Bhagavad Gita says Brahma Bhutta Prasannatma. One who actually understands his Brahma Bhutta, he is a joyful soul. So in order to be a joyful soul, you have to have devotional service. Just simply understanding your Brahman and you may repeat, Aham Brahmasmi, Aham Brahmasmi, that you won't be joyful. That is painful. You just be bored and full of pain as you stop all activity, trying to deny everything. And so you, there's a lot of suffering, a lot of torture there. But for a devotee, it's prasanatma, joyful. Yeah? So Sita Pragna, yeah. If you understand it properly, we can say it's the same as Brahma Bhutta Prasannatma. Yes, we could say that is actually fixed in consciousness. One who is Brahma Bhutta Prasannatma. He'd be a joyful soul because he, he knows he's not the body, he's not concerned in satisfying the demands of the body. So he's happy, he's taking pleasure in the self. The soul is by nature joyful. The one who has understood he's not the body, one who has understood he's the soul, he'll be happy, he's joyful, even in the miserable situation. Even in the COVID, he's not thinking, oh, no money, Oh, no job. Oh, no business. No, no. He's just thinking. Krishna's, Krishna's done it. He's just chanting Hare Krishna, and he's waiting. When Krishna's ready, then things will come. Things will change. So the devotee is not disturbed by the situation. Is able to tolerate everything because he knows it's not the body. One more question, Guru Maharaj. 
Uh, can we say that achieving this Siddha Pragna stage is uh, one of the symptoms of advancement as we follow the Krishna consciousness process? Oh yes, definitely. One who is Krishna conscious, he should, he should also come to that position of Siddha Pragna. He should be fixed in transcendental consciousness. Yes, that is required. Without transcendental, without that coming to that platform, then he won't be able to maintain his Krishna consciousness. He will fall back under the material energy. So yes, one has to have that transcendental knowledge to be steady, to be fixed in Krishna consciousness. You have to have that knowledge. But that was why Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya wanted to teach Vedanta to Lord Chaitanya. And he taught him for seven days. He wanted to give him that. He thought he's just a young man, he should learn Vedanta, it will help him to maintain his sanya. So Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was giving knowledge to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And this he thought. So yeah, we do. All devotees in Krishna consciousness, it's required trip, trip. that we should read the books. We should learn the philosophy. We need to hear. We need to read like this Bhagavad Gita. Oh, it's a big book. Oh, big book. Oh, how I can read such a big book. Oh. But this is up for our whole life, remember. You have your whole life to read this book. So you read it a bit and a bit and a bit and gradually you read it more and more and gradually, gradually it starts to make sense and you start to remember oh, what did Krishna say? oh, what was that question Arjuna asked in the Bhagavad Gita? What, how did Krishna reply? we should start to think about the Bhagavad Gita the different slokas the verses that people recite Prabhupada was telling, there was one devotee, he was to go to South India to open a temple. In the beginning, we had no temples in South India. So one devotee was going to go to South India. And, and the devotee came to Prabhupada, he said, Srila Prabhupada, he said, oh, I have to go to South India to preach Krishna consciousness. He said, everyone in South India, they all know Sanskrit. And I don't know any Sanskrit. How will I ever be able to preach there? So Srila Prabhupada told him, he said, you simply learn Bhagavad Gita and you pick out 60 slokas from the Bhagavad Gita. And with the, if you pick out the right verses, then you can defeat everyone. He said, if you know the Bhagavad Gita, you just learn some 60 verses from the Bhagavad Gita, it will be enough to convince anyone about the authority of Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Cows also from performing the activities we consider many birds. So there is a question raised by some people, why Krishna is favoring cows different than others when, when the activities are all the same? Yes, but we have to understand that everything about the cow is very special. Just like the cow, he give, the cow gives milk. And milk is the most valuable of all food. And from milk we get ghee. And with ghee we perform sacrifice. When we do sacrifice, we have to offer ghee. Where do you get the ghee from? We don't use goat's ghee. We don't use camel's ghee. It's from cow's milk you get ghee. You use the ghee for the yagya. So it's very important. And the cows also, everything, the, 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 the dung, the stool from the cow, it's a fuel. And the urine of the cow is a medicine. You can drink the cow's urine as a medicine. 
will help you to keep your liver healthy. And the cow also uh, only eats grass. They're gentle creatures. They simply take some grass and drink some water. They're not so greedy. So the cow is a very special animal. It's very important in the human society. Because uh, we know milk is so important for all, especially the young children, that they get milk when they're young, will help them to develop their brain, to develop good strong bodies and good brains. So everything from the cow is very good but very valuable. So we, we do appreciate the cow. And it's our duty to protect the cow because she is mother. Just like mother, when the baby is born, mother will breastfeed the baby. And so after a little while, then the cow gives the milk and the baby can drink the milk from the cow. So cow is also one of the mothers. And the cow, this planet belongs to the cow. The deity of this planet is Mother Bhumi. And Bhumi is in the form of a cow. So this planet actually belongs to the cow. And the cow needs us. She's a domestic animal. We need the cows and the cows need us. So there's reciprocation. I didn't answer the question. You, you answered the question. But may I add a little bit? Yes. The cow is very special. When this, the mother is able to give milk only for a couple of months. After which every doctor knows that every another uh, person should know that if the mother is unable to provide milk, the cow's milk is the only milk that sustains the babies and civilization. Without the cow's milk, you cannot use goat's milk, you cannot use camel's milk, it will cause jockeys, it will kill the baby. So that is why I believe the cow is the most sacred and most important animal to human civilization, which is why Krishna must have. Also, there's another reason, one of the reasons. And also in the Puranas it is stated that the cow, the next birth, will be as a human. And human life is good level, it's very difficult to attain. So the cows have a special mercy from Krishna to be born as humans. That's why we have to respect the cow. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare. Thank you very much. Yes. This is true. There was also a test done in this country for many years back. The doctors and scientists trying to uh, test with the newborn babies on soya milk, not on cow's milk. They want to test for six months. The baby didn't even last for one month, date. There was a test in this country and it was many years back, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it looks like how he teaches his cow's milk for the new baby, equivalent to mother's milk for the newborn babies. Just one more thing. One, one more question, Guru Maharaj. When we are involving in Krishna consciousness activities, automatically we are getting pressure our senses also getting pleased. How do we take it? This is spiritual sense or it is a material sense? Well, at the way you say you're getting stress, is it? Tension. When we are involving in Krishna consciousness activities, we get pleasure. The body gets pleasure and everything. So we feel very happy and senses also activated automatically, enjoying it. So how do we differentiate this between uh, material or spiritual kind of things? Well, the difference is that when you're engaged in devotional service, these activities are something which you can go on doing them again and again, and you get more and more pleasure with them. Whereas material activities, the more you do the same thing, the pleasure is less and less. Material activities are very static. The pleasure is less each time you go on 
but with spiritual activities, activities engaged in the service of Krishna, then it's a dynamic situation and the pleasure increases. It may be difficult in the beginning, but as you go on, then you will get more and more pleasure. So that's the difference. If you say you're getting pleasure in doing service for Krishna, yes, it's true. If you do service for Krishna, you will feel pleasure. But the difference is you can go on doing it more and more, you get more and more pleasure. So don't stop. You're feeling the pleasure. That's natural because you're connecting to Krishna and so our spiritual senses are awakened. The soul is awakened. You're connecting to Krishna by service. So yeah, we will feel pleasure, we will feel happiness. That is the transcendental platform. And that pleasure will increase. You go on doing it more and more, you get more and more pleasure. But the difference is material activities, just like happiness, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes happiness in the mode of passion, and happiness in the mode of passion, in the beginning it's like nectar, but quickly it becomes poison. Whereas happiness in the mode of goodness, in the beginning it is difficult, not very pleasing. But if you go on doing it, then gradually, gradually you get pleasure. So, if you're actually engaging in the service of Krishna, then uh, you will feel more and more pleasure as you go on. If you're not feeling that pleasure as you go on, it means you weren't doing it for Krishna. You were simply engaging in activities on the physical platform or on the mental platform. And that's why maybe in the beginning was like nectar, but it then it became poison. Because you were not actually doing it for Krishna. There was no consciousness of Krishna. So we have to become Krishna conscious. Some devotees will say, first you become conscious and then you become Krishna conscious. Some people are not even conscious. You know, they're like a dead man or a ghost. They're doing activities without any feeling or any emotion. So first we have to become conscious and then you have to become Krishna conscious. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Shura Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we'd like to thank His Holiness, Bhakti Vikna Vinashan and Srimad Swami Maharaj for delivering to this Bhagavad Gita class. Uh, today we'd like to make some announcement. Today we have dual sponsor, we have two sponsors. Uh, first sponsor is uh, Rosemary Mataji, who has sponsored the deities uh, Raja Boga, the gallants for the deities and the devotees Prashadam on behalf of her late father Mr. Ganesan, her late mother Mrs. Batumale and her late brother-in-law Mr. Hello. Kennedy. We'd like to pray to Sri Sri Radha Krishna Kanaya to bless the departed souls and we'd like to give them uh, a, a deity garland as well as uh, uh, a picture of Radha Krishna Kanaya. Hare Krishna, we'd like to invite uh, Rosemary Mataji. Hare Krishna Mataji. The next, uh, we also have uh, R.M. Ravi Chandra Prabhu, who also sponsored uh, the Mangala Arti Sweets, the Deity uh, Breakfast, the Deity Raja Boga, the Deity Sweets, the Deity's uh, Evening Boga, and the Deity's Ratri Boga, as well as uh, as well as uh, the Mahaprasad, uh, uh, as well as the uh, Prasad for the Deities. So we'd like to thank Ravi Chandra Prabhu, and we'd like to invite uh, Ravi Chandra Prabhu to come and uh, except the Mahagalan and also the deities.
So we also like to pray to uh, for his late mother, Madam Muniamal, on her on the sixth month today. Uh, today we like to thank uh, His Grace Damishwar Chajanya Prabhu and his team for cooking our today's feast and also uh, Sukata Goranga Prabhu and, and Navadi Prabhu for cooking and distributing 200 packets of uh, prasadam as food for life. Next week festivals, uh, today 25th, we have uh, Sungai Sipur Radha Yatra. Uh, Maharaj will be attending the Radha Yatra and Maharaj will come back to our temple on the 27th. On 27th evening, Maharaj will be going, going to Gokul Nam Hatta for his program. 27th, which is this Tuesday. 28th, Wednesday, Maharaj will be given to Bhagavata class here and will be doing an evening program at Putri Gunung, Center by Sevai Hari Prabhu. On the 29th, Thursday, Maharaj will be giving Bhagavatam class and will also be doing an Alusta program in the evening. Um, and then Maharaj will be heading down south for the Malakara Diyatra. On 31st December, Saturday evening, His Holiness Bhakti Radha Swami Maharaj will be coming and doing a program with us here at the temple, 31st. And on 1st uh, January 2023, that will be Malakara Diyatra. So Hare Krishna. Hare Jai Shri Lakshmi Pati. Now uh, we will be 